postzygotic barriers uh, prevent the hybrid zygote from developing into a viable fertile or fit adult. So uh, what we're talking about is two species that can mate. Uh, they are not uh, they don't have prezygotic barriers impeding them from producing a fertile viable offspring but something happens after fertilization that uh, prevents them from truly being considered to be of the same species. So since we're talking about zygotes forming viable fertile adults it makes sense that uh, two of these are going to be a reduced hybrid viability or reduced hybrid fertility. So in the case of reduced hybrid viability, uh, maybe progeny are formed, uh, but something may not enable them to be as fit, as able to survive as their parents. And that's what we see here uh, with this particular salamander in the genus Encetina, uh, which uh, the parent species can mate, they can produce viable progeny, uh, the eggs that will the eggs will hatch, and we get these progeny that are just not as agile, not as uh, successful, not as able to uh, survive in their habitat as are either of the parent species. So they have a reduced viability. Uh, or maybe they're viable and they're vigorous and they're great and awesome but uh, they're infertile and that's what we see in the case of mules uh, so here is one parent who is a donkey another parent who is a horse uh, they can mate and they can produce a mule and as it turns out there are many cases of animals in the genus equus uh, which are capable of interbreeding but producing sterile progeny or somehow uh, unfit progeny. You might uh, suggest you look up a z-donk, which is a cross between a zebra and a donkey. Uh, so mules are widely used um, as work animals, as beasts of burden. Uh, but the thing is, they are sterile because they have uh, they don't have a proper number of chromosomes uh, because these two parents have different numbers of chromosomes so somehow they're capable of producing progeny but these progeny are sterile because they're they're aneuploid uh, hybrid breakdown so maybe we get some crosses between uh, different species or what we perceive to be different species and uh, they produce offspring that are viable uh, and those offspring are fertile, uh, but it doesn't seem to have any staying power. It seems like over a generation, something happens, and the hybrids just don't uh, seem to have that staying power. Uh, that through the generation, something happens, and they, they break down. Uh, so maybe these uh, hybrids can breed, crossbreed with either of the parent species and produce viable offspring, but it seems like the, the, the hybrids themselves are not able to sustain uh, the lineage. Now the biological species concept works very well for many organisms. Uh, most of the organisms that you may encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Animals and plants. Uh, eukaryotes that have sex. Uh, but when we look at fossils, we can't use the biological species concept because we have no idea whether or not uh, different fossils, fossils are capable of interbreeding with each other. Uh, prokaryotes, uh, bacteria, archaeans, uh, the biological species concept doesn't work for them because they don't have sex. So they can't be reproductively isolated by sex because well, they just can't. And there are a lot of organisms uh, that are eukaryotic that are asexual. 
believe it or not. Uh, more on that when you take organismal biology, which I strongly suggest that you should. Uh, but the biological species concept does work for many organisms. And it does emphasize this absence of gene flow, this, this reproductive isolation. Now, sometimes we do see gene flow between distinct species. Uh, so like I said, the theory of evolution is comfortable with this. It is compatible with this, this idea that uh, species are not rigid and unchanging, uh, that there are there is going to be some gray area around the edges. So one example we see are so-called growler bears, which are hybrids between grizzly bears and polar bears. So grizzly bears are of the species Ursus arctos. Polar bears are of the species Ursus maritimus. And uh, occasionally, rarely, we see uh, progeny, such as this one, which you can see has a bit of... of the more grizzly characteristics in the muzzle and around the eyes, but looks more like polar bear in the, the coat elsewhere on the body. So if we can't use the biological species concept universally, we need to come up with some other species concepts, some other definitions of species. Um, what groups these different organisms together to say, well, we think that they are of the same species. Uh, the morphological species concept, as the name suggests, says if they look similar, we'll say that they're the same. Uh, but this can be very subjective, because remember, we expect that within any species, there's going to be heritable uh, diversity, heritable variability. So, how similar do things have to look so that we, such that we say that morphologically they are the same? Um, that can be somewhat subjective. So, for example, if you were to compare myself and, say, uh, Yao Ming or Shaquille O'Neal or any of a number of people uh, based on morphology, uh, you might say, well, it's kind of the jury's out on whether or not we're the same species, just uh, as an example. So it is kind of subjective. Uh, ecological species concept suggests that uh, we define similarity based on the ecological niche. Uh, are these organisms uh, similar enough and doing the same services within the ecosystem? Uh, so we can apply this to sexual and asexual species. Uh, the phylogenetic species concept is uh, sort of like pruning out branches on a family tree. We think about Darwin's illustration of uh, the first phylogenetic tree, where he says, I think tree. And uh, you can say, well, we can trim out a branch and say everything that's crowded on this branch uh, is of the same species. And usually when we do that, we're looking at something like DNA sequence data and saying, okay, well, if we have uh, similarity at the DNA level in terms of nucleotide sequence or protein amino acid sequence, and we say that there is a greater than, oh, let's set it a guideline, 95% homology. 95% of the nucleotides are the same, for some gene or suite of genes, we'll say that they are the same. That they are the same species. Uh, but again, there's some problems with subjectivity in this case, um, where we don't know, you know, 95%, 99%, those are not necessarily nature's ideas of uh, what defines a species. Uh, those are percentages that we assign to those lineages. So, while we have that sort of muddy idea of what a species is, 
uh, we can now stumble forward and consider uh, how speciation occurs, the process of species forming. And we say in general that it can occur in one of two ways, either in uh, through isolation of habitat or allopatric speciation from different countries, a uh, thing like patric, like patriotism, fatherland, uh, or sympatric in the same uh, country speciation. And of the two of these, allopatric speciation is the one that's much more uh, frequently observed. So here's an illustration showing how uh, you could have allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation occurring in two different uh, in a population of fish here. So maybe some sort of barrier occurs uh, that isolates these fish from these fish and over time they'll become reproductively isolated. Uh, or you could have the case where that barrier does not prevent uh, them from reproducing but uh, for some reason or another whatever is adaptive the blue fish uh, tend to mate with the blue fish and the yellow fish will mate with the yellow fish. Uh, so more frequently what we'd observe is something like allopatry. So allopatric speciation uh, we disrupt gene flow by geographic isolation. So the flightless cormorant is, uh, that's the bird that was on the, the first slide that I showed you in this slide set. Uh, it's found in the Galapagos Islands and uh, we don't think that it came from necessarily flightless ancestors but that there was a flying species that made its way to the Galapagos uh, and uh, there it became reproductively isolated from other cormorants from the mainland and over time you know it found that flying maybe just wasn't for it. Uh, now what defines an allopatric barrier is going to depend on the organism as well. So if we had something like the Grand Canyon uh, if we had a squirrel on the the north rim and the south a squirrel on the south rim they would probably never see each other. Their ranges are not great enough. They can't. They're not great hikers. They don't uh, aren't going to go down to the Colorado River and swim across to find each other. Um, so they're effectively reproductively isolated. But a bird like a, a hawk or a vulture or uh, something like that could easily fly from the north rim to the south rim. Uh, pollen from a plant could flow from on the on the wind from the north rim to the south rim. So that same thing that's a barrier to one organism might not be a barrier to another organism. So what's going to happen once these allopatric barriers arise um, are the same process that, that we've been talking about previously. Uh, mutations will accumulate. Uh, maybe something that's different about those habitats will drive natural selection in different directions. Uh, and genetic drift is going to be a factor as well. So mutation, genetic drift, remember those are random processes. Natural selection is not a random process. So reproductive isolation also can arise as a byproduct of divergence. Uh, so different selective pressures mean different uh, alleles are going to be selected for, uh, for example, in different levels of predation in something like these mosquito fish, these mosquito fish. Uh, and we can look at the bodies of uh, mosquito fish from different populations and see that there is some sort of uh, sculpting that is occurring in the body shape of these different mosquito fish uh, under different cultural conditions. So I'm going to stop here before I go into evidence of allopatric speciation. Another 15 minutes are up, so take a break and we'll come back.